touch it, touch it. Did it feel good? Why? Oh shit, you already forgot. Because the fellowship is created by. Is there greater engagement right now, yes or no? Do you enjoy yourself more or less than when we began? And I did nothing, I just decided to again. Yes or no? What if they don't want to gauge? Come here, little bastard. I'm going to hug you. You know, I can't go to this intense, but I am Charlie! And then they'll change their states. How do you feel the difference in how you feel right now? Say, I. Then don't let this go. The only way you can do that is if you start to measure. See, you can't manage something you don't measure. You know that. But how often do you measure the state? And yet, this is where all engagement comes from. Because if you're not fully engaged, how can you never expect that? Mark is fully engaged. Agree or disagree? That's why you're all here. So, you must have some respect for this man. I should do. If you do, you're angry with it, right? <laughs> You're tired. See, I have full of mercury. I'll explain in a moment. That's why I'm sweating so much. I sweat anyway, but I'm not mercury poisoning. So I'm a body shaking. I'm here to give you a million percent. A hundred million percent. I've done that for 39 years, every day of my life. That's why I have a brand. You can have a brand too, but you have to measure. You have to say, where am I zero to ten? And if I'm freaking below nine, what am I doing with my life? In an intimate relationship. Where are you? Zero to ten and you're engaged. But that's below nine, you have no passion. You might have love, but you don't have passion. If you're below seven, you're probably friends. There's nothing wrong with that. But you can have a friend and not be married to them. It's a very different game. I'm suggesting to you that this is the most important element in life because what's going to make you feel alive is engagement and your control of it. How fast can you change your emotional state, your engagement? How fast can you change it, my friends? How fast? By a radical change in your body, you can do it this quick. Try something right now. Make a crazy sound of excitement. Just make a sound. Go, make a sound. Try another one. Try another one. How many of you used to make crazy sounds when you're a kid for no good reason until people told you to shut up? And you know what? You let yourself become conditioned into what society has taught us to be to be appropriate, and what that's cost you is spirit. It's cost you the flow. And you look at the people that you're most entertained by. When you look at who you watch YouTube, if you watch a business person like Mark, who you really feel moves you, it's because they do what nobody else does, because they put themselves in state. He doesn't feel like it every day, no more than I do. But he still does it every day. You know why? He does it enough until it becomes him. It's like an athlete. You build muscle. There's emotional muscle. What's more important than emotional muscles? They are the spiritual experience of life. What's more important than courage? Courage unused. What happens to it? You don't engage your courage enough. If you don't engage it over and over again, what's going to happen to it? Grow or shrink? Which one? Faith uninvested. What happens to faith that you don't actively use? It dwindles. Passion unexpressed. Does it grow or shrink, my friends? Which one? And everything you want in your life, you can have if you have the resources of these emotions, but these emotions come from being in a peak state. So whether we're the presidents of countries, of which I work with many, royalty, athletes, the best performers in the world, entertainers, they're all geniuses of this, and I get the phone call because they want to go to the next level, but they're already great, but they won't settle, because they're always looking to be more. Because they know a 2% difference, like we should take out a week from now, you know, 10 degree difference, a month from now, six months from now, you have a different rice. Or, people come see me when they have a challenge. They're either the best in the world or the challenge. They have a birthday with a zero on it. 
right? They lost their job or they built their company, sold it for $500 million, and now they're bored and they want to figure out what to do. People suddenly, when they get hungry, is when they look for answers. I don't deal with people who are hungry. They think I'm an idiot, I'm some positive thinking guy, because they're never going to investigate the truth. They don't want it. But who comes to me is somebody who's hungry. And what we understand our hunger, the tie to that, a new simple discipline. We're at like zero to ten. And if you're below an eight, you're hurting who? Yourself. You're hurting your family, you're hurting your business, you're, you're part of that group, even though you probably never identify with that group that's not engaged, because you're more engaged than they are, I know. But you're not engaged with the level that you deserve. Who's with me here? Say, ah. This is what engagement feels like. Now, if you'll sit down, before you do, I would like you to get three crazy hugs in the better seat, and I'm going to give you one last piece here that's really important. Three crazy high fives or hugs, which you prefer. Go! I'm thinking about that for a long time because they've been so disappointed. Everybody's a kid thinks this way. And then gradually we have enough disappointments, frustrations, sometimes betrayals from people we care about, that we get gun shy and all of a sudden people start going, I'm pessimistic, I'm skeptical. Let's be honest, you're being gutless. It takes no guts to be skeptical. It takes no guts to be pessimistic. It takes no guts to go on the internet where no one knows who you are and write shit about people. So you can make yourself feel good by having the illusion you made someone smaller. So you have the illusion you're moving up, and our society is filled with that. So, extraordinary life is life on your terms. What would an extraordinary life look like for you? My bet is most of you have an extraordinary life, but how many of you know how great your life is? How many still want more? Raise your hand if you want more. Say, ah. How many want more love, more joy, more success, more freedom? How many want all these things? Say, ah. Then whatever success is for you, some people, extraordinary life looks like three beautiful children. Some people, extraordinary life is a billion dollar company. Some people's extraordinary life is writing poetry. Some people's extraordinary life is working the Tenderloin District, helping those people, not just feeding them, but loving them. Everyone's discovered what an extraordinary life is for them. And if you know what it is, that's the first step. Then you need two master skills. Please drop them down. These two skills are what will give you that life. The first skill is the science of achievement. The science of achievement is whatever you want to achieve, there are rules, and if you follow the rules, you can win the game. So for example, if we talk about our bodies. It's a science to be vitally healthy, to be strong, meaning there are rules. Everyone here is biochemically unique, but are there some universal rules that if you violate them, you're going to have low energy or disease in your body, yes or no? You bet you will. Are there a set of rules that if you will abide by it, we're going to have an abundance of energy and a vital level of health, yes or no? So, I don't care what you believe, if you jump off a cliff, you are going to drop. I don't care what you believe, if you violate the science of your health, you're going to have problems. The same thing is true financially. I spent four years, now it's been six, interviewing some of the most brilliant financial minds literally in the world. Warren Buffett, Carl Icahn, Ray Dalio, by the way, one of them I just mentioned, you probably didn't know the name of. How many know who Ray Dalio is? Look at this room. 7,000 people, only a couple dozen. The richest people in the world all know who Ray Dalio is. Ray Dalio, you threw on the screen, has produced more returns for investors than anyone alive, including Warren Buffett. Everyone talks about Warren Buffett, but Ray Dalio is the guy. Ray's interesting. Amazing man. This guy, when I interviewed him, he was, is a man who is the largest hedge fund in the world. Rich people give their money to hedge funds. And when they give to hedge funds, a big hedge fund might be like 15 billion, raise 165 billion dollars. Ten times bigger than anybody else. When they interviewed him that day, the Prime Minister of China, the head of China, called, they're not going to call for coaching about what to do with the currency. This is a level. This is a man, to give you an idea, who's produced a 23% compound return for 21 consecutive years. Think about what all the ups and downs, the bear markets, bull markets, all that stuff. Total genius. You don't know him because you probably couldn't get access to him, to give you an idea. But I got access. And a fan of mine turned out for 20 years, which was really helpful. And I went in for a 45 minute interview, and as my nature, I go deep, and four hours later, three and a half hours, I left. And one of the most important questions I asked him was this, because I wanted to write this book, 
and I want to get people, anyone, somebody's a billionaire, somebody just started the journey, somebody's a baby boomer thinks they can never get free, or somebody like just got out of college, millennial, going, how do I ever get out of debt? I want to be able to help all those people. By the way, I donated all the pockets that book, $5 million in advance before it even came out, so we could feed 100 million people. That was not my plan to write small checks, but they got me started, right? So I asked him, I said, what? What if you couldn't give any of your money to your children? And you can only give them a set of principles, a distinctions, a scientific plan, a strategy that would cause them to be financially free, what would it be? He said, Tom, can I ask this to every one of these 50 multi-billionaire investors? They all have great answers. This was the best. He said, Tom, I have spent 15 years of my life obsessed with that question. He said, not only do I want to take care of my kids, but I also have all these charities that when I die, I want those people to continue to be helped. And he said, I have an organization of 1,500 people who work around the clock to come up with the best ideas, and they all compete with each other. It's a very, very tough place. This place called Bridgewater, where he runs this operation. It's very big. And it's a dog-eat-dog -dog competition to come up with the best stuff. And he goes, I know I won't be here for that. And he said, I also know the markets are always changing. And he said, I noticed something. Everybody tells you what to do financially, and they say diversify, and they tell you put this much in bonds and this much in stocks, and that's supposed to protect you. And he said, no one talks about the dirty little secret, which is when the markets drop, like 2008, 2000, it all goes down. But no one says anything about it because eventually it comes back, and then the same people sold you everything and go, well, that's just the market, you don't know what to do, and they do the same thing again, and it happens again. And people can lose half of all they earn overnight, right? So he said, I want to find a sustainable solution. And I'm not going to tell you the details here, that's why I gave you the book, because I want you to have this for yourself. But the bottom line is he laid out this plan. And he's well known for putting in this thing called an all-weather portfolio. All-weather means he doesn't know where the market's going to go. The smartest people in the world are not the ones on CNBC telling where the market's going to go, because no one knows. The smartest people in the world, everyone of them told me, I don't know. Here's what I think, and I'm going to be wrong lots of times. So I diversify, put together a portfolio that'll win no matter what. His has been the most successful. And so I asked him to explain it to me, and he did in detail. I did 18 hours of prep for this one interview with him, and he said on the air multiple times that there's no one that's interviewed that's more prepared for you than I. He had a pitch and catch, and because of that, I got to this final level where he explained it to me. I said, you know what? You just told me the most important set of principles to financial freedom that anyone has ever shared that I'm aware of in the world. He goes, well, that's true. <laughs> he was not, he didn't disagree with me on that. Right? And I said, but there's only one problem. He said, here's how you bake a cake. Use some sugar, use some chocolate, use some dairy products. I said, but you didn't tell me the amounts. He goes, Tony, I can't give you that, that's my secret sauce. He goes, you have to have a five billion dollar net worth, and you have to give me a hundred million minimum to start, or I don't even talk to you, and I haven't taken money for 10 years. I said, that's my point. You're not going to give anybody this anymore. You've closed your fund. You're running it for the people you're running it for. You just told me that if someone goes to the average advisor, they're good people. But this is a poker game where only the best in the world win at the financial level. Unless your financial advisor is won a bunch of gold medals, he told me, you're screwed. It's only out of time for there's a real problem. I said, you're the ultimate gold medalist in the whole world, and you know the answer. And I said, you're a totally generous man, you're gonna give away half your net worth. I said, why don't you help people right now? And I got him laughing. Once I got him laughing, I knew I had him. He goes, well, I couldn't do it because I use leverage. I said, design one without leverage. For the average person. He goes, well, you know, it wouldn't be perfect. I said, your idea of not perfect, they call it the Da Vinci of investing. Some call the Steve Jobs of investing. I said, your idea of not perfect will forget anybody on earth. Well, and then he said, let me think. And I felt this tingle down the back of my spine. Because I wasn't writing this book to make money. I was writing this book so I could help people around the world. I watched people in 2008 lose their homes in mass, lose every half of what they had. And that wasn't a statistic. That's how I grew up. So I wanted the answer. And he starts laying this, as well as two, and he gives me this exact formula, which he's never revealed ever in his entire history. I was shaking inside. And he goes, go test that. Go hire someone to test it. And back testing, he goes, back testing doesn't mean anything. You know, past performance doesn't equal future performance, because people usually do it like three or four, five, or 10 years. Do it over the entire modern year of investing, 75 years, and see how it did. Now think about all the ups and downs in the last 10 or 15 years, 2000 dropped 50%, 2008 50%, and everybody's waiting for what's going to happen next. 
and over all world wars, all that went on. We went and tested, I had two different firms. One guy called me 1130 at night, he's never called me 1130 at night. He's told me, I gotta talk to you. I said, what happened? He goes, in the last 75 years, this made money 85% of the time. And when it lost money, 15% of the time, when it made money, it averaged 10%. When it lost money, the worst loss was 2008, and it was a loss of 3.9%. When everyone's losing 50, that's all they lost. If you could go to Vegas and be right 85% of the time, make 10%, and a few times you lost, you only lose less than 4%, how many of you go to Vegas on a daily basis? So I put that in the book. By the way, all my partners and friends are like, let's make this into a company. Let's, I said, no, this is anybody can do it. And I just gave it to you so you can do it to me. I'll tell you what I gave it to you also. Because this last January, do you remember what the markets were? We have the worst January in the history of the stock market. Two trillion dollars disappeared, how fast, my friends, in a matter of like 10 days. And everybody, all the rich people, and all the successful people in business, including this year over here, they're all in dollars. And so everybody's freaking out the market dropped like 600 points in the middle of the day. People are like, is this the end? Are we finally seeing the end? And they went to who they got to it in Davos. They brought in Ray, and he walks up and down here, and they said, what should people do? And Ray's very quiet and calm guy. He goes, well, Tony Robbins wrote a book. I gave it my formula. You literally said that and described it. And if you got what he did, when the market was down, for example, the very first month down 10%, and people were freaking out, he was up 1%. Right now, as of two days ago, I don't know this day, I didn't look, but as of two days ago, the market was 7.8%, this is up 12.21. 12, you know, 12 it's 47% greater than the market. If you do it once a year, you adjust it once a year. Now, I'm not telling you all your money now, I just want you to know, there's a science to achieving. And that's true of finance, that's true of your body, that's true of a lot of things. And by one more thing I'll tell you, I have a partnership now with the number one rated firm, I'll throw up on the screen for you if you're interested, Gentleman who's rated number one wealth manager three years in a row by Darren's. No one's done that in history. It's called Creative Planning. And for the last two years, he's been number one wealth manager in America by CNBC. We have 20 billion in assets. I'm on the board of directors. I'm also the chief investor psychology, and I'm Hughes' partner. So if you go there, I benefit so you know. But I want you to know, if you want to get a second opinion, he'll do it for you for free. And the reason he's rated number one is most wealthy people have what's called a home office, where they have a group of people, not somebody just selling you a product, you have somebody who's a fiduciary. It means legally they have to put your needs ahead of their own. If they told you to buy Apple this morning and they buy it this afternoon cheaper, they have to give you their stuff. Peter's number one in that area. So if you want, you go to getasecondopinion.com. That's my commercial for you. But he can do a review for you. You can implement it yourself or you can work with them. But the level of detail you is amazing. So I gave you the book so if you want to take care of that in your life, you can. But my larger point is simple. There's a science to achieve it. And the science of achievement can get you from where you are to where you want in anything. And the way you speed it up is you find who's most successful and you model them. Write down this. Success leaves clues. Success leaves clues. If someone is able to succeed year after year after year, like a Valerie, like, you know, Peter at Greater Planet, then perhaps you're not just lucky, you might want to find out what they're doing and avail yourself of it because you can trust decades in the day. You can have trial and error learning. Or you go to someone's already figure it out and say, how do I do this and save yourself that time? I'm here today because my whole life has been modeling people so I can achieve it. But here's why I came this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whatever the hell it is now. I came here because my deeper mission is for you to master the second key to an extraordinary life. And it's the one our culture values a lot less. And it's a hell of a lot more important than I tell you you're not going to get impression you go back to it. Because that's the way we're trained to think. The second master lesson to an extraordinary life is the art of fulfillment. The art, drive it down, of fulfillment. What do I mean by the art of fulfillment? Success is a science. What do I do to succeed in business? There's a science, there's a set of rules. But what fulfills us is totally different. Look at this woman's glasses right here. Take a look at these glasses. Can you see these people can on these glasses? These are very special glasses. Not me, her, there they are. the glasses. Oh, look, turns the camera, right? How that is. So, she has got a very special idea of these glasses. You can't really tell if they're still at an angle here. My point is, these glasses, what do you think of these glasses? I think they're awesome too. I don't see anybody else with glasses like you. That's right, because these fulfill her. Other people go, what are those crazy ass glasses she's wearing? <laughs> right? We're all different, I'll give you an example. Steve Wynn is one of my dearest friends and a 
But one of my clients, as I said earlier, built half of Las Vegas. A multi-billionaire started with less than nothing. His dad went broke, had a $400 million debt, he left college for how to pay it off to his family above ground. Now one of the richest men in the world, a very brilliant guy. And I'm having these conversations with Steve, and I'm thinking to myself, I, I, he calls me first of all and he says, Tony, where are you? Thinking, Why are you asking that? I said, I'm in Sun Valley, Idaho. We both have vacation homes there. He goes, I'm in Sun Valley, Idaho. He goes, guess what? I said, what? He goes, it's my birthday. Aren't you going to come see me? <laughs> and I laughed. I said, of course I'm going to see you, Steve. I didn't know you were here. I just loved you. He goes, Tony, really, I want you to come over because he said, I gave myself a birthday gift. There is a painting that I have come here for, I can't remember how many years, after 18 years, I think he had, but almost two decades. And he goes, I'm coming, I wanted it, and finally came up for sale, and he said, I outbid everybody at Socrates for it, and he said, I paid $82 million for this painting. And I'm like, wow. So picture what you think an $82 million painting means to you. My picture was like a Rembrandt, something, you know, from, you know, that period at least, like, but just something gorgeous, I don't know, something religious, spiritual, something. And so I drive to his house, and I got all this anticipation to see what this painting's going to be like. Steve's such a wonderful human being, runs me in, goes, Tom, come on, check this out. And he walks me in the room, and there on the wall is this painting. Put it up on the screen so people see it. <laughs> and I looked at it, and I said, I paused, I held my breath for a moment, and I said, Steve, I thought it was like Emperor's new clothes, I said, dude, it's the red one square. <laughs> He's, no, no, it's a rough girl. I said, I know, but it's a red one square, 82 million dollars. I said, dude, give me a hundred bucks, and an hour, I can do this shit, I promise you. He didn't like that. I got to laugh it, right? You know, but here's why I tell you a story. Because what will excite you and fulfill you, or be different than this person, even if that's your son, different than this person, different than you, even though we may love each other, what fulfills us is not a science, it's an art. And if you don't know what's going to fulfill you, what are you doing all this for? How many people do you know that achieve their ultimate goal? Have you ever done this? Have achieved the goal and then your brain went, is this all there is? Who here has ever had this moment? Raise your hand, say ah. Isn't that moment worse than failing? Because most of us in this room, if you fail, you don't fail, what do you do? You get up and just what? Try something else. You're gonna keep persisting till you find it, right? But if you succeed and you're unhappy, now you're what I call technically screwed. Right? And it's the worst feeling in the world because you're just not fulfilled. So every one of us needs something different to have that sense of fulfillment. But I can tell you two things that we all need to be fulfilled as principles, not as rules. Number one, you must grow. If you don't grow, it doesn't matter how much money you have, it doesn't matter how many academy awards you have, it doesn't matter how many people respect you, it doesn't matter if you have four perfect children, it doesn't matter if you have so much love, you're not going to feel it. How many follow what I'm talking about here? Say, ah. So if we don't grow, we what? Grow or you die. If you don't grow your business, it's die. If, you don't, if your relationship's not growing, it's die. There's no plateau. Who's with me on this here? Raise your hand, say ah. So I'll give you a perfect example of this. I feel like we lost, in this country, a national treasure a little bit more than two years ago. I'm talking about Robin Williams. How many of you in this room I want you to raise your hand, not if you like Robin Williams. Raise your hand if you love this man. Raise your hand if you love him. Keep your hand up nice and high if you would. Keep your hand up. Look at the number of people who love this man. It's 98% of them. There's only 2% assholes in this room that didn't like Robin Williams. I've asked this question this year in Sydney, Australia, in Tokyo, in uh, Beijing, China, in uh, South America, and Peru. I've been all over the world. I've been to 16 countries this year. Every place I've asked, every place I've wanted, every language being translated, on average, 98% of people raise their hand saying they love it. And I always say, don't raise your hand if you like it. Now here's my question about this incredible soul, Rob. Was he a master of the science of achievement, yes or no? Yes or no? He had a dream to go to Hollywood and do his own TV program. How many people have that dream, and how many actually get it? He did it. He had a dream that not only have his own TV show, but he's going to make it number one. And some of you are ancient enough like me to actually remember that show. What was it called? Mork and Mindy. Some of you, it's replayed enough, you still know about it. Right? Number one show. Then he said, I want to have the most beautiful family. And he did it. Achieved it. Then he said, I want more money than I could ever spend. And he achieved it. Then he said, 
I want to make movies, and he did it. Then he said, I want to make movies, and I want to make movies, I want to win an Academy Award, watch this, for not being funny. His primary skill. And he won an Academy Award for drama, for dramatic performance. He did all of that, and then he hung himself. How do you explain that? Now some people say, well, he had Parkinson's, he had this, he had that. He suffered his whole life. He used alcohol, he used cocaine, he used everything he get his hands on. Because he made everybody happy except for himself. And he left a beautiful bride, wife, and children who loved him, and hundreds of millions, maybe a million, I don't know the real number, I can only tell you how to go away. Every country I've been in, 98% of people translated in those countries, probably they loved him. There wasn't enough. Yes, he had Parkinson's later, and he knew where they go, Louis bodies in his brain. But he suffered his whole life because he suffered because he made everything happen. He never asked him more to fulfill what he thought of all about the science of the That's why I came out of here. Because you guys are masters of achievement you be in a room like this. And I know there's different levels of achievement, but it's all relative, right? If you're in a room like this, you're hungry, you're driven, you're some of the best, you came here because you want more. You don't settle like most people. But I hate to have you wake up someday, I know you're not going to hate yourself. But to have that emotion of feeling like life is not the richest experience that it could be, you know, it's only because you were so driven by the cultural conditioning of achievement. And I'm not suggesting don't achieve. I achieve, but I also fulfill, and I know people that are so fulfilled. This little character over here is constantly fulfilled, because he knows it isn't just achievement. It's really about something big, he's got a mission, he's got a sense of He knows what fulfills him, and he lives it. Richard Branson is one of the most fulfilled human beings going to be. He's because he's a multi-billionaire. He's an achievement, but his great benefit is he's fulfilled. I can't name a dozen people I've met, and I've met 10 million people. 50 million I've worked with, 10 million people I've had these deep relationships with, and at least 50 multi-billionaires, and I couldn't name more than a half dozen that I can tell you honestly are really truly fulfilled by their own description without bullshit. The ain't money that's going to do it for you. It's not achievement that's going to do it for you. It's the best time you make up for And so, this experience is what my life's work was, is to get people to experience what's way more than here. And if you'd asked me a year and a half ago, two years ago, uh, was I living that? I would say, of course I am. And I would agree with 100%. I was. I have the most amazing wife. I have a woman as my wife who I would die for. I've been together 17 years. I'm not Rolling smoke, this one was the greatest thing that happened in my life. And it gives me, if I had nothing else in my life, I have four amazing children, I have three grandchildren, I've got 31 companies, I've got a thousand employees, I'm in all these industries, I get to do what I want, what I want, at the level I want, I have financial freedom, all those things, and I come from nothing, so I'm proud I did achieve. But more importantly, because it's been meaningful the way I've done, I felt fulfilled. That's why I'm here, I don't need to be here. I didn't come here for money, I didn't come here for a talk, I didn't come here to pump you up. Thank you very much. Thank you. So how do we get that fulfillment? Here's what I found out. I've always talked about, even as I started this morning, this afternoon, we talked about high energy, high energy rich. By the way, financially poor is not as bad as energy poor. You go with energy, everything's gonna break down. Your relationship's gonna break down. How can you have passion when you're exhausted all the time? You might love each other, but you're not gonna have real passion. How are you gonna be a great parent when you're exhausted all the time? How are you gonna create breakthroughs when you make it every day? And what sucks the energy out of us is not food or sleep. We can do with those things that are important. We can do it out of the times when we have to. It's lack of and we're heading a world that's about to disrupt itself massively because the very technology we're creating is going to disrupt, according to Oxford, 40% of all jobs over the next 15, 18, 20 years. What are we going to do in four or five years when there's three million truck drivers in this country and Ford just announced in four years they'll have self-driving trucks? Why would I have something that only work eight hours legally because i got to give them rest Why I can have a truck that'll 24 hours and it doesn't crash and it doesn't get drunk and it doesn't give them shit and attitude? 
and I can depreciate it. And that technology will get better and better geometrically. And no one's preparing those truck drivers. We're going to have a massive disruption in our culture. So maybe what we really got to do is really decide how to make sure we find ecstasy in this moment right now. Because whatever challenges are, let me tell you something. Problems and happiness have no relationship. Can you have huge problems and still be totally happy? Yes or no? Come on, guys, yes or no? But our brain, the mind won't tell you that. You're more than the mind. You got a heart, you got a soul, you got a spirit. And most of us, because of technology, have gone more and more here. And this is a great tool, the mind. But you've got to train it to do what you want. Some people see, maybe you see my documentary, uh, uh, I'm Not Your Guru, and you see it, please. Awesome. Now, one of the people ask me about is, why are you jumping that 56 degree water every day? Are you insane? And I do it because it's a discipline where I train my mind. When I tell it what to do, we don't negotiate. I don't let my mind run me. I let my heart and soul run me. And I train this brain to use, to use it when I need it for strategy, for tools. But your mind will never make you happy. Only your heart run. Your mind, only your heart will join happen. You start to have what's going on. Is it organic? Where did it come from? Where do I put it? Where do I throw it away? The mind is just, how many know what I'm talking about here? Say, ah. So, one of the pieces that will shift things for you is, instead of energy rich or energy poor, high energy or low energy, I was in India with a dear friend of mine, named Christian J. And he said, Tony, what if you switch those words and just called it beautiful states, high energy states, and low energy states are suffering states? I said, well, I think that would be that description. He goes, well, then let me tell you what my spiritual vision is. So he said, don't spiritual vision. He said, we'll live in a beautiful state every day, no matter what, even when it doesn't go my way, because life is too short to suffer. Who believes that, by the way? Say, ah. I, I was intrigued. I said, he said, why? Say, why do you have that your spiritual vision? He goes, because when I'm in a beautiful state, I don't have to think about how to treat other people. I always do the right thing. And when I'm in a suffering state, you know I'm a good human being, I treat people poorly. So let's talk about it for a moment. If I asked you one of the greatest experiences in your life, what was it? A moment, I'm sure you've had many. Pick one. What's been one of the most beautiful, magical, magnificent, sacred, sexy, sensual, loving, meaningful experiences of your life? Just one of them, I know you've got plenty. And we went through that, you can tell me the story, but I'm out of time, so you can't tell me the story. But if you told me the story, and we did this for a while, which I've done with people before, you'll always see the same pattern. The pattern of what makes you most alive is things that give you these emotions you want most. Beautiful states like love, or joy, or gratitude, or excitement, or hunger, or drive, or creativity. See, you don't just have happiness. If it's only one state you're going after, your brain needs variety. Ever, seen, you know, ever been so happy you smile so much your face hurt? Who knows what I'm talking about here? So we need lots of beautiful states. But here's what I can tell you, when you're in a beautiful state, everything goes. Now what's a suffering state? I don't, I don't think anyone in this room might have been wrong. I sure know if you would ask me a year and a half ago, do I suffer? I would have laughed. Suffer? Are you kidding me? See my wife, see my wife, see what I got to do, see who my friends are. I have the most magnificent life. I would be a big phony, I would be totally authentic. It's just, just like achievers aren't fearful, they get stressed. No achiever suffers, but they do. Because it's not consistent, that word's not consistent with our identity, is it? But what if suffering was any state that takes you out of the heart and soul that makes you feel fulfilled? Like frustration, anger, overwhelm, stress, worry, concern. And by the way, I would get pissed off and frustrated, but I would say to myself, that's not suffering, that's part of life. That's what I believe, and whatever you believe, you're with. And I then began to realize, no, it's not. Suffering states are the result of the brain. We have a two million year old brain in our bodies and it's designed not to make you happy, it's designed to make you survive. And that's what almost everybody does, they survive. Happiness is your job. And I just come by to remind you how you can do it and have it be sustained if you want to know who's interested. Then just for a moment, generate some energy in your chair right now. With the person next to you, get some energy going for our time. Come on, turn it up. Come on. So, if you want to be 
you happy? Here's my question first. How many of you in this room want to be happy for the rest of your life, no matter what? Let me ask a second question. How many are not just wanting it, are totally committed to be happy every single day for the rest of your life? You say that now. The only way you can have that is if you make the connection that problems and happiness have no relationship. How many know somebody who has a life that you love to have and they're still pissed off or worried or concerned or freaked out? Maybe you say, right? Well, if I was there, I wouldn't feel that way. Bullshit. Because the mind is always looking for something. Because this two million year old brain is basically survival software. And what it's doing is always looking for what's wrong. And whatever you look for, you'll find. Try this for a second. Look around this room and look for everything that is brown. As fast as you can, I'm going to test you. Look around anywhere. Anything that's brown, brown, clothing brown, people brown, anything, look for it. Look around, look around, I'm going to test you. Look behind you, don't miss anything that's brown. Look around, look around. Close your eyes. Tell me everything you just saw that was red. Raise your hand if you saw a lot more brown than red. Raise your hand and say, I. Open your eyes, look for red now. Look for red, look for red everywhere. Look for red anywhere you can find it. Look for red, look for red. Raise your hand if you found a lot more red this time and say, ah. Why did you find more red this time? Because in an old book called The Good Book, it says, seek and you shall. In fact, seek and you shall find. Whatever you look for, you're going to find, even if it's not there. I'll prove it to you. How many self days should call the ground just to feel successful? Burgundy and call it red just so you can get bigger points. If you think someone's a jerk, will you find jerkiness in them? Maybe that's not there. Won't you shade it? Yes or no? If you think you're a good person, will you find goodness in them? Yes or no? If you think you're a jerk, will you make yourself a jerk by finding some part of yourself? Yes or no? So we get what we look for. The brain is looking for what's wrong. Remember, this is long as you live. What's wrong is always available. It says what's right. It's all about where you go. And this brain, survival software, is looking for what's wrong. So it can fight it or flight it. There's one problem. You don't have a saber or two tire to run from anymore. So now it makes up things like, oh my god, what are people thinking of me? So I better shade the picture and I put on Instagram so I really come across even better. Or do I have enough money in a country here in the United States, for example, where the poorest to the poor? I, I put on focus down before. I was the poor. But if you're in poverty in the United States, or you're one of those people marching saying those 99, we're 99 percent, and those one percent jerk off, they don't care about anybody but lying when you do that, because you're the one percent of the world. If you're in poverty in the United States, you're the one percent of wealth of the world. But conveniently, you're not thinking of those people only about yourself. And the reason is, write this down, suffering always comes from obsession with yourself. Suffering disappears when you're trying to give or focus or share beyond yourself. When you obsess, not when you take care of yourself, you're going to take care of yourself, but when you obsess about yourself, it's there. A woman says to me, no, it's not, I'm not obsessed about myself, I'm obsessed about my children. My children, I'm so worried, they're not doing well, they're, they're one of them's on drugs. I said, yes, but the real reason you're suffering is because you feel you failed them. If you ever look at when you continuously suffer, it's because you're focused on yourself. Raise your hand if you can see this, right? You think about the thoughts, what you're not getting, what you're not experiencing, what you're not finding. And what's interesting is when we're inside our own head about ourselves, we're in that survival software, and we go into the scarcity that freaks us out. And we don't treat people well. Somebody asked me just recently, they said, how do you explain what kind of person could do what we saw in Nice, we saw in Paris, we saw in San Bernardino, we saw in Orlando, like go into place and kill other human beings, men, women, and children. They don't even know. Whole blood and murder. I said, I can't tell you who did it, but I can tell you who didn't do it. It wasn't a fulfilled person. It wasn't a happy human being. Happy human beings, fulfilled human beings, human beings in beautiful states don't try to hurt other people. They don't try to steal from other people. They don't try to tear other people down. They don't write shit about them on the web. And they sure as hell don't kill people, plant bombs, or shoot people with bullets. It takes a really disturbed person to do that. And you know what? Most people are disturbed at times because the mind will make you disturbed even though you're not. Because it's a device. It's going to fight or it's going to fight. And if you let this run your life, you go to sleep, you're going to have the pain of all of the still at times. When I came by today to remind you that you're in charge and that you can't change it with just a couple of distinctions. And what are those distinctions? Number one, 
You have to first identify that you do suffer, even though you would never say that. I would never say I'd suffer. And say, well, of course I get pissed off and frustrated, but that's such a minority of my time. Is any moment worth suffering over in this life? And when you're suffering, by the way, suffering begets more suffering. Is it true? When you're suffering, you affect other people. Even if you don't try to hurt them or say something, do they feel it? Do your kids, does your husband, does your wife, do your co-workers feel when you're suffering, yes or no? So you're stealing from that energy. And it's simply because you didn't do the following steps. Here they are. On an open, here they are. One, you gotta identify your favorite flavor of suffering. Because we all have them. Is yours worry? Is it pissed off? Is it concern? Is it feeling less than? Feeling not enough? What is your favorite flavor of suffering? What is the emotion that puts you in a state that's unresourceful? When you're unresourceful, it's hard to solve it, isn't it? You might say, well, I want to just go solve this. You can solve your problem so much faster in a resourceful state, in a beautiful state, in a calm state, because when you're not hooked, get through to people. But when you're hooked, people feel that. They don't know how to react to it. It fires off their suffering. People then consciously start to not connect. And then we end up in that disengagement that at the lowest level shows up in business, and the most important level shows up in your intimate life and those you love. And so if you want to change it, you've got to discover. So what, if I asked you right now, I'm waiting with the glasses, stand up so nicely, what's your favorite flavor of suffering? That I'm not enough. What's your favorite flavor of suffering, sir? Not being recognized. Shit, you just got from 10 million people across the web. Yeah, you're doing good. Shine that up here. Just not the fuck. You're, you're, you're acknowledged now, right? Okay? What is your most favorite flavor of suffering? Worry. Right? Mine was frustration. You know what I found out? I realized my happiness was so cheap. All it took was this for me to become unhappy. Because remember I told you, I had 31 companies, seven different you know, areas, different types of businesses, all around the world, thousand employees. I got a question for you. What are the chances of somebody screwing something up right now with that many companies all around the world on three continents, thousand plus people? What are the chances of somebody messing something up right now? What are the chances? Tell me quick. 100% and all I need is have this nearby. Look up, there's one right there. There's a text. I can see it. Somebody's messed something up. And what is messed something up? What did it take for me to lose my happiness? Someone not to do what I think they should do ideally now. And the more people you care about, the more people you interact, the more the greatest chance that this is going to be happening all the time. So I find myself happy, happy, happy. Ah, shit. Ah, I'm sort of, oh, man. I use a different word. F, you know, something, you know. When I was really suffering, I wrote a different language. You know, so who, who uses different language when you're suffering? Let me see if your hands here. Right? I don't even know when you're suffering, but language is. And so I began to realize I'm giving up my happiness over this. If in order for you to be happy, everybody's got to do what you think they should do, you're never going to sustain happiness. I would love for you to be happy the rest of your life. I can't do it for you, but I can tell you how because I'm doing it. You have to decide what's your favorite way of something, and you have to make the most important decision of your life. And I never said this, I would have said the most important decision of your life, I believe in the past is who you love, who you spend time with, is who you become. I still think that's one of the most important decisions of your life. But my life and I both agree that the most important decision is deciding not to suffer anymore. The life is too short, and then you're going to find joy, beautiful states in every moment, and you're committed to it even when it doesn't go your way, even when it rains on your way. See, I don't want to ever feel pain if I can help it. I don't know you, but I hate suffering because I grew up suffering. I have four different fathers. I have a mother that loved me. But she would beat the hell out of me. She put liquid soap down my throat until I threw up because she oh tried to lie that I wasn't. That was crazy stuff. But she'd been the mother I wanted. I would not be the man I'm proud to be. Because I, I wouldn't have this story. Why would I be here? Why would I go feed a billion people? Why would I do things I'm doing? So you know what? Sometimes not getting what you want is what makes you into something that's not something you want to give. So if you make this decision, I don't want you to ever have pain. If I can help it, I can. So that means you make a decision. I'm going to be happy even if someone I love dies. Because what good is it for you to live in suffering when they die? Do they want that? But we have a cultural condition that makes us think that we're supposed to be this. And so many people think suffering is a positive emotion or it's noble. Suffering people don't inspire others. They don't lift others. 
to what you're suffering, you're not there for the other people that don't understand what you know, who are crying, who are hurting, you can be comforting, but you can't do it when you're suffering, you're inside of you. Who understands what I'm talking about here? Say, ah. So if you make the decision, or I say a decision, most people's idea of decision, they state a preference. I decided I'm going to do this, but they don't commit it. If you're totally committed, what do you do? I always tell people, if you want to take the island, burn the boats. Because as long as there's a way out, our brains will take it. So my invitation to you is really simple. You can get free of suffering, but in order to do it, you've got to realize it's all your expectations that make you suffer. I'll give you one quick example. I'm fortunate enough, like Mark, I have my own plane, so I can fly you know, anywhere in the world, and I traveled this last year to 16 countries, so it's a great privilege to have a bed that goes straight to China nonstop. Unbelievable. But most of my life, I took commercial aircraft. And uh, after a while, I started chartering in the U.S., but going overseas was too expensive, so I didn't do that. I thought about half my time, I was on an airplane. About every four days, I was on an airplane while on stage, one of the two. Pretty intense life. So, Interesting enough, in those days I go three times a year to Australia, I still do, but in those days commercially, and I get on Qantas Airlines on a flight, here in San Francisco or LA in those days, and it's a 14 hour flight, and there's just one problem. 31 companies in those days, it was like two dozen companies or 15 companies, I got all these people I'm responsible for, I'm a committed guy, and where, how am I connected 24 7, right? We all know what it is, it's all these tools that we go, all this technology. But I was used to it domestically, you got connection to the internet, you're going to fly. But you get on that 14 hour flight, <laughs> death, no technology, no web. And I was like so frustrated, why did they do this? I was 14 hours, they're going to be so productive, oh my god. Who knows what I'm talking about here, okay, that's what I'm talking about. So what happens? One day after years of going through this, before I had my own plane, I'm on, I'm on the flight, and Qantas Airlines announces we're about to take off, guess what? We can now proudly tell you we now have international internet. And it was like people cheered. Some people stood up in the aisles and clapped. I didn't, but I felt like doing it. It was just like, this is incredible. It was like God descended into the building. We have internet. We got Instagram. We got Facebook. We got email. This is the most amazing thing. And then what do you think happened within 15 minutes? What do you think happened? Tell me. Come on. It broke down. And when do you think it worked again? Never. 14 hours without it, and people are like, this is bullshit! I can't believe this crap! I'm not putting up it! 15 minutes earlier, it was a miracle. Now it's already an expectation. Write this down. If you want to change your life, trade your expectations for appreciation, and your whole life will change in that moment. Trade your expectations for appreciation, and your whole life will change in that moment. If you are suffering, there's only one reason. Things aren't meeting your expectations. What are the chances of everyone in your life meeting your expectations for the rest of your life? What are they? What are your expectations that God or the universe will meet your expectations every moment? See, I'd like you. Are you married, sir? Is she here? Oh, she's with your twins. How beautiful. Congratulations. I would never want to see you have any pain if I could ever avoid it if I could bring it back when I'm not God. So I can do something different since I'm not right. I can get you to consider something, but if you did it, it would give you fear. It would be an absolute commitment in yourself to say, life is too short to suffer. God has given me this creation, and I'm going to love every moment. I'm going to find ecstasy every moment with my children, even when they do crazy shit, even when they're regrets. I'm going to have to with my wife, even when she doesn't seem to be listening to me, or my husband isn't. I'm going to do it even if she left me. I can't control it really, but I can control one thing. You can make a decision that you are going to find beauty in everything in life and you're going to learn from everything in life, and that is the only way you'll be out of suffering. Otherwise, it won't matter how much money you make, it won't matter how many people love you, it won't matter how many kids you have. Are there going to be disasters and challenges for all of us, yes or no? Yes or no? All of us, I don't care how rich you are financially, I don't care how smart you are, I don't have to be an IQ for genius, I don't care if you've got the biggest company in the world, Every person here is going to experience extreme stress in your future. Everyone here will have something, a robbery, a house that burns down, an earthquake, somebody that cheats you, somebody steals money from you, somebody you totally trusted and then they screw you over, somebody that betrays you. Aren't you glad you came to this positive seminar? So you thought it was Mr. Positive Thinking, you're so wrong. 
See, I'm a realist. I don't believe, I'm not stupid. I don't think that everybody, I know that most people are not fit and healthy. Most people around the world do not have a relationship where they're totally passionate. Most people do not love their work. True or false? That's true. I'm interested in a few of you. I'm interested in a few of the local people's faiths versus the masses that suffer.